And I'll tell you, in the fall, the moss is really stuck to the rocks good here. These steep rocks. And uh, summertime, even way better. But right now, after the snow's been melting, it's just like walking on uh, icing on a cake. It's weird. I wiped out a few times. It's funny, I gotta keep reminding myself that it's not stuck right now and I can't just cruise around on it anymore. Anyway, this big timber behind me is an urban logged. You see all that lichen, that green, pale green lichen hanging down. That's what keeps our, all the ungulates alive all winter in here is that stuff. So you got big timber, steep cliffs, and uh, the deer thrive. Unless there's an overabundance of predators, and then they got a chance. <laughs> but anyway, I've packed a few big bucks on my back down these bluffs right where I'm sitting, and it's never been easy. Tell you what, but lots of great memories. Okay, what do we got? Hi, my name is Mary. I live in Washington State in a small town in an area near Joint Based McCord Air Force Base. I ride my bike on the trail, the rail trail there, and listen to a lot of the emails you read and find them enlightening. They always remind me of my encounters I've had. My sister, who passed two years ago, I'm sorry to hear that, lived with her boyfriend in western Washington at one of the mountain passes into eastern Washington in a cabin. And sometimes, sometimes I would go visit her. One morning I woke up to hear my sister talk about something that was left in the backyard. I don't know I didn't know it at the time, but for several years she had visitors and would sometimes tell me to take a whistle with me if I went out to walk the property. That morning she told me to go look in the yard. I went out back and close to the house there was a spiral staircase that had been dug into the ground. I told her boyfriend I thought her boyfriend had done it because he was always working on unusual projects. So, first thing I did was go down to the end and touch the wall. As I was down there, I got this feeling someone was watching me, thinking it was my sister. When I look up and see the top of a head darting out of sight, someone trying to avoid my glance. Then I turned around and climbed back up. I went into the house, mentioned her boyfriend, and she told me he didn't dig it. So I went back home and noticed there was a strange presence around me after that. Every time I got on my bicycle to go up the trail, I could hear the brush rustle like it was right beside me, racing me. I never felt threatened and I talked to it most of the time. I only saw it once while visiting my mother. There's no periods at all, so bear with me. I was in the backyard looking up at the tire on top of the camper my nephew was staying in, wondering how I was going to move the tire that was holding the tarp down. It was coming off. Then I turned to go into my mom's house and I heard some noises. I went back around the corner and saw it only for a moment, moving the tire. It was eight to nine feet tall, furry and brown. The back legs were very muscular, which explains why he could run so fast. It followed me around for years, coming and going everywhere I was. I could feel it. Lately, last week, I heard a scream somewhere around my apartment building. I thought it was the kids next door at first playing, but the sound was so deep and loud. A scream like a roar. And I heard it in the morning thinking it was a truck out there making noise that used to scare me. But when I've looked into the woods and seen glimpses and seen whole families of them here in my town and the outer lying forested areas, to me they're like people. I've seen them shape shift and I'm curious, but the more I hear of them and talk about them, the less they scare me. Of course, I keep my distance to try not to look too deeply into the woods when I pass by. Thank you for your channel and all the hard work and care you put into it so people like myself don't have to feel we are crazy anymore. I can say what I saw, and I can say what I feel, and it's such a relief to have more experiences. I'll share later. God bless you, Mary Fulkertz. All right, Mary, thanks for sending that email in to us. Next time, do me a small favor and put some uh, periods of commas in there, all right, so I can read it smoother. It's really challenging without that added in. Oh, I'm getting cold. It's a uh, late afternoon and I'm on the shadow side of the hill. I'm high up and the heat is not coming off the sun. Lake of the Woods Cabin. Hi, Steve. My story was read before, but only half of it was shared. Oops. I think I've had a couple of those. Mainly because not all of it downloaded onto your phone, so you couldn't finish it. You don't need to reread it. And I don't need, need it read. A couple of people commented they wanted to hear the whole story, but if anything, just enjoy the full story yourself. 
Okay, man, I'm sharing it, and I'll read the whole thing. Thanks for sending that in, by the way. <clears throat> Hi, Steve. As a hunter and fisherman, I was glad you started to share this aspect of the great outdoors. I've been fascinated with the subject since the Patterson-Gimlin footage. My sharing is an experience and not a sighting, but I have wondered about this for many years. This experience took place in the 70s in the Lake of the Woods area in Ontario. Her family has a 100-year lease on some land up there. Our grandfather built a small cabin on this land soon after World War II, which we still have to this day. The cabin has no roads to it and never did. My grandfather and a couple of his brave friends brought everything to build the cabin in the dead of winter, over the ice on trucks. Then in the springtime, they went back over the water on boats to start the build. The trip over the water to the cabin is like a water maze. You have to go around forest-covered island chains. There are reefs to consider. There's almost endless rocky shorelines on both sides of you as you motor along. Then finally have it all open up to arrive at our cabin. The cabin sits on a rocky cliff at the end of a point facing west. Best sunset every night. My grandfather did all this for hunting and fishing cabin. Sometime later, the government made the area into a forest reserve, which killed the hunting for him. Somehow, I never did know why. But my family over the decades enjoyed fishing for smallmouth bass, northern pike, and springtime lake trout. There's a 32-pound lake trout on the wall up there. <laughs> That's a chunk of trout, man. Lastly, being a forest reserve, but very few people after us were allowed to build. So this whole vast area is ours to steward until we decide to pack it in. Finally, my experience. Thanks for sticking with me. I was born almost last to my mom and dad's family of six. As I got older, my father entrusted me to use a 12-foot duck boat, the small outboard motor we had up there. My dad said I could go out in this boat as long as I would stay in the bay behind our cabin. The bay was about two miles long and about 200 yards wide in places. The bay in the whole area had a thick, dense forest right up to the granite shoreline. One late afternoon, I was in my duck boat simply heading back to the dock. I was soon overcome with a feeling of dread and fear. I remember turning my head to the right, turning my head toward the shoreline from where the fear was coming from. Yes, that's what I said, from where the fear was coming from. I don't know what that means, but the feeling was coming to me. The whole time I was looking to the passing shoreline, feeling shook, not knowing what was happening to me. I remember it was an awful feeling. I remember I was away from the shore, but glaring at the shoreline, looking at this one small tree with the entire forest behind it. Why that tree? That tree was just sitting still, no movement. It was a very calm day. I was focused on that one tree, that one spot on the shoreline. To tell you the truth, I'm so glad nothing stepped out of the forest. As I went further down the bay, the feeling went away, and I was fine. As soon as I got back to the dock, I tied off the boat and ran up the hill to join the family in the cabin. I never told my dad or anyone all my life until now. Plus, in a big family of six, no one asks a kid that comes blasting in from the outdoors, did anything happen to you out there that was strange? Plus, I was taught not to interrupt adult conversations. So as a young buck, like I was, I just moved on to the next thing, probably supper. I don't think my dad knew of these wild people by how my dad just cut us loose when we got there. I think he was more focused on the waterways and fishing and less about hiking around the vast forest. But I did have a golden retriever with me in the forest and even in the boat. I'm sure that helped keep me safer. You have mentioned that before. I'm 60 now and thanks to your channel I feel that I understand better what these feelings and pressures could mean and what to do. Because of you and the people that share their lives with the sharings in this channel. I enjoy the outdoors. That alone is worth the price of admission. Thank you for making a place to learn more about our crazy outdoors. I'm enjoying the fly fishing apps. Thank you, James Patrick Patterson. James, sir, thank you very much for emailing us. And uh, I'm pretty sure if you've looked into it all, Ontario's got so many sightings around there. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's endless, endless, endless. The feeling of dread sucks, man. I kind of sort of had that last weekend, a week ago on the island. And then I put that video up here uh, a few videos back. I got to videotape, videotape the dead, dead, dead silence, which is creepier than shit. But I haven't ever, I haven't ever had the dread. Well, no, yeah, I've had that dread. Yeah, I've had the dread. <laughs> All right. What do we got? Hey, Stim, hey, Steve, Jim Barkley again with a question about today's posting. Can you please ask Bobby Sue to describe the female voices she heard in Vancouver Island? 
In July 2015, while fishing up a small tributary to the Livingston River in southwest Alberta, I heard what sounded like high-pitched human female voices on the hillside above the stream. My son and I had four-wheeled several miles on a trail at the tributary when I stopped to start fishing. My son walked off up the trail to go about a mile further up. Just after we went out of sight, I heard the chattering start above me. My ultra-smart Labradoodle, whom I mentioned in one of my emails you read previously, was there and we both stood quietly and listened. My dog Amos was totally fixated on the voices and never moved a muscle until we could no longer hear them. It was a friendly sound and conversation between two females. Estimated distance, probably 80 to 100 yards, but conditions were very quiet up there. Kind of sing-song and cadence with the high pitch you would expect from a human female. The difference being I could not understand a word exchange in the conversation. I can state with confidence that there was nobody else up there that day and we rarely see anyone. Bobby Sue's description of the voices she heard would be of interest to me and I'm sure to many others. A couple quick additional items. When the voices quit, Amos and I turned back to the creek to start fishing. As stated, it was incredibly quiet. No wind. This in itself is unusual in the mountains. But a small sapling at the edge of the stream was slowly waving back and forth. Amos and I stood staring at it for a minute and then walked the 20 feet over to where the tree, which quit moving before we got there. So I start fishing downstream, into the deep, walled canyon below. At about the third sharp turn, something big races up the extremely steep, loose shale canyon wall, making a hell of a racket, and then gone. It was around a sharp corner, sharp corner so never saw it. But whatever it was, it was extremely fast. On my way back upstream, I climbed the canyon wall and all fours to get back to the trail to the truck, it took me a good five or six minutes to climb that steep, loose surface, cliff face. Whatever ran up there, I did it in about ten seconds. Never found the tracks either, but I was pretty sure I knew what it was. Is this where I say it had to be a really big athletic bear? <laughs> LOL. Anyway, the email turned out kind of long, but I'd really like to hear Bobby Sue's description of the female voices. Thank you, Steve. You're doing a hell of a fine job. Keep information. Good information is invaluable. Keep listening to your instincts and stay safe, man. All right, thanks, Jim. Thanks for sending that in. I'm sure Bobby Sue's almost guarantee is she's reading, listening to this right now, and maybe she can make a comment in the in the make a comment about that in the comment section below the video. Eh? That'd be that'd be pretty easy. Instead of throwing the dice and throwing an email to me, and I might not get it for freaking ever. I'm getting cold. I'm going to have to go. Titled, Can Anyone Tell Me What I Saw? Dear Steve, oh, better mark that as red or I'm going to get in trouble later on from everybody. <clears throat> Dear Steve, my name is Leona. I'm 52 years old and I'm an educator. A friend of mine recently told me about your channel. After listening to only a handful of your episodes, I realized I now have a safe place to share my experience. I know the Sasquatch exists, and I have had numerous experiences. This is about something different. The time of year was late winter slash early spring. Eight years ago in Bentonville, Arkansas, my daughter, then age seven, and I were driving south on Northwest A Street. As we traveled up the hill, we both saw something, but we still did not know what it was. At the top of the hill, there was a clearing about 30 yards across with dense woods on either side. There was no vegetation on the trees yet. As we began to climb the hill, my daughter said, Mommy, what was that? I could only tell her that I didn't know. What we saw was a creature that emerged from the woods, walking bipedally. It then crossed the clearing on all fours before standing bipedal once again to disappear into the woods to the left of the clearing. I've never seen anything like it before, and to this day I am befuddled. The creature was massive and lean, very muscular. Its black hair shone in the afternoon sunlight. Based on the height of the trees and the fact that many people hiked the trail, I determined the size of the thing to be about 14 feet tall. At the shoulder, went on all fours. What? I estimated that on its hind legs it stood around 17 or 18 feet tall at the shoulders. What? I would say this thing was close to 900 to 1,000 pounds. It resembled a cross between a wolf and a razor-backed hawk, being very stout and muscular around the neck, head, and shoulder area, tapering off at waist to slender hips and lean legs. 
and its tail was bushy and close to a third of its overall length. Its snout was long and its ears were big, hence my equating it to a wolf. However, the way it moved with such swiftness made me think of wild hogs. The whole sighting lasted only seconds, but every detail is burned into my memory as if it was were yesterday. It was very hard to hide my surprise and fear of this thing from my daughter. I still have nightmares and wonder if anyone else has witnessed this creature. I need to know what it was. Thank you, Steve, for all you do to help people like me. You and the work you do is much appreciated. Sincerely, Leona Valdez. All right, Leona, that is one hell of a description, especially the, the height numbers you gave are almost almost unheard of, I believe. I haven't heard of anything quite like that myself. That's freaking crazy. But uh, I know there is a handful of people that often complain that I don't talk about Dogman. <laughs> I don't know why they think I'm they think I'm intentionally not talking about Dogman reports. And I read what I get, you guys. So if anybody can relate to what was just emailed in, let her rip in the comments below. All right, don't be scared to just go ahead and speak and speak of it and let's see what you got okay one more i'm out of here it's getting frozen hello steve first of all i want to say thank you for providing a safe place for folks to share the stories and knowledge this story i want to tell is not a sasquatch but i think it adds to the round table of knowledge i've heard many stories of mine speak and that's what this one is about this happened about 20 years ago when my son was just a baby my wife and I went shopping at the big, this big box store. We did this once a month. We got what we were after and started heading to our car. Our son was in his infant seat in the shopping buggy. We, wa we walked up to the car. Now I tell you, as busy as these places can get, there was not much commotion in the parking lot at that time. I was three steps to our car and all of a sudden I hear this voice. The voice was so crystal clear as if the speaker was right there speaking in my ear. It said, get me out of here in the most clear but really evil sounding voice. I immediately started looking around as I thought the voice came from a child's toy or a portable game. Steve, there was no one close enough that this voice could have been that clear, not that loud. It wasn't especially loud, but was at the level of someone in very close proximity. My wife took our son and put him in the back of the car and she, she got in the front. It was at that time that I noticed that the pickup parked alongside had a dog in the back. He seemed like he was a bit scared himself. The dog had his ears slightly cocked, but was intensely looking at the front of the store. I was worried at first until I realized the dog was every bit as scared as I felt. I couldn't believe I didn't see him before my wife carried her son into the car. Every hair in my body stood on end, but I went immediately opened the trunk and loaded up all that we had purchased, took the buggy to the vestibule, and got in the car. I wanted to run like hell after what I heard, but instead kept my head down and went back to the car, not wanting to show the immense fear that I was feeling. I was hardly even breathing as I started the car, but I set out of the parking lot quickly. I looked at my wife and asked, You did hear that voice, right? She answered with, Yes, let's please get out of here. It was after we hit the highway before we even talked about it. She told me at first she thought she heard the voice from the dog, but he seemed to be freaked out too. I was freaked out as the rest of that week. I was freaked out the rest of that week, but something had kicked in that took over, and it was the need to protect my family no matter what was going to happen. Again, the parking lot was sparse and the nearest people to us was a family getting out of their car three lanes over in the parking lot. So eventually, I thought it was a projected voice possibly from another world. It was unseen, but I could feel it was definitely there. There was no way the voice we heard did not come from a toy as it was too loud and clear. However, I thought that mind speak was one person to another. I think differently now especially so as the dog obviously heard it as well. Steve, I don't know what the hell that thing was, and I don't think I really want to know. I'm glad it didn't make itself seen either. However, after hearing the stories of so many others that the creature my family encountered that day could have had us at any moment it wanted, I didn't know how to feel about that. The interesting thing is that my son was totally unaware of anything going on, and he was awake for the whole thing. I still wonder about that. Sorry for the long email, but I need to unload that story. Thanks again, Steve, for the massive amount of time you dedicate yourself to with this stuff. You're a good man, and all my best to your listeners. Sincerely, Clark. Clark, that is one hell of a story, man. And uh, I am definitely not the guy to answer with any clear explanation for what you heard, that's for sure. I mean, there's no shortage of people who have heard a voice clear in their head saying, telling them to get the hell out of here, don't go any further, or whatever, and seeing those Sasquatches combination with that but 
that's something else. I don't know, man. I don't know what to say myself. I haven't a clue. But if somebody here watching this video does and can relate to exactly what was just shared here, comment away in the uh, comment section below and you guys can have at it. All right? Wait, wait. I gotta go. It's now freezing cold. It's straight down. <laughs> I got a ways to go because I couldn't. There's too much snow in the logging road, and I and it was still a hard crust on it. So I just I just cruised right up on top of that crust and snow for quite a while. And I got a funny feeling by the time I get back down, I might have to sink through it the whole way back. It's gonna suck. But there you go. You guys got something you want to share? You feel is gonna help somebody, or you need some help? Email it to sharemystoryhowtohunt.com or tellmystoryhowtohunt.com, and and we'll get to it. We'll share it. All right. Well, hopefully that Canon camera stays on. I have uh, my other one. I don't know why. I have to figure out the settings, but they would uh, shut off on their own while recording video. The audio keeps going, and I'll just have to fill it in with something. But oh, it's a bit of a pain in the butt. But anyway, I. Uh, Slowly climb this freaking mountain. Got a couple of cameras that I had up here since last November. It'll be interesting to see what's on there. And I was uh, trying to find some shed antlers from a couple, two different bucks. I knew we were on here in the fall, but I'm not sure where they wintered. I found a lot of beds over there where I typically do, but nothing. And I flew the camera up here actually too in the wintertime and, and caught a handful of deer on it right there. Actually, I'll, I'll put this on, I'll show you where I am. But anyway, now I'm starting to get into the snow. And that's going to kind of suck because if I'm trying to find the antlers off those bucks, it could possibly be buried in the snow. So I'm going to slow down on the searching and I'll come back another time when there's not so much snow and uh, have a thorough look around. This is a real special mountain to me here. I've had a lot of special times here. Spent a lot of time here. Seen a lot, harvested a lot, done a lot, and I've basically had it to myself. <laughs> it's not that easy to get to. It's straight up and then into these cliffs. But, but anyway, I got some emails I want to share. There's one here, I hope I can find it right now. And it kind of scared the crap out of me, only because I've been there and this guy really got across what happened to him clearly and it's not good not a good uh outcome psychologically afterwards you know um here it is found it can i listen to this one this is in chilliwack lake which i'm familiar with a lot of you people are too they're from bc and uh where this guy was as the crow flies it looks like it's only it's, I don't know, half a kilometer, two kilometers, or a couple miles away from the Washington State British Columbia border. Steve, appreciate all the effort you put into bringing awareness to the outside world. This is my story. I've suffered nothing but ridicule and jokes in the last 35 years regarding this incident. No name attached to this, please. Thanks for that. September 1986. It was the year of Expo in Vancouver. It was also the year that changed my life. I was in my late 20s. I was a fishing, hunting, outdoors fanatic who figured he'd had life by the tail. I had a great job where I worked 12-hour shifts, and when I worked three days straight, I got paid for 40 hours and had the next four days off to do whatever I wanted. It was a perfect schedule for me as it allowed me to be in the great outdoors four days a week and absorb Mother Nature in all the glory. I was BC bred and raised and learned bushcraft, hunting, fishing, and shooting from my retired uncle. He was a great teacher. We had many hunting trips under our belts. BC is a vast is vast and I've been in our neck of the woods many times exploring Bray, Bray Lauren, Gold Bridge, Seton Portage area which is a serious hotbed for numerous sightings coincidentally. On this particular four-day stretch I decided to stay close to home and camp on the south end of Chilliwack Lake. I don't know if you're familiar with this lake but in the 70s and 80s it was a great place to camp because it was within an hour of my house. The far south end away from the government campsites was usually empty in off-season, and even during summer months, was not overcrowded. 
I arrived that September morning at about 10 a.m. I had stopped at the government campsite at the north end of the lake and had a had loaded the back of my truck with a bunch of firewood. Remember when firewood was free? I remember looking around the government site. There's not a soul there, not one boat in the dock or in the water. The south end of the lake had a semi-sandy beach, and if your truck was a 4x4, you could cross Depot Creek and camp right in the sand near the edge of the water. When I arrived this Thursday morning, there was no one camped anywhere, not a soul on the beach. I knew I'd have the, at least a day by myself before the weekend warriors showed up with their loud music and party attitudes. I pulled my truck parallel to the water, about 20 feet from the creek and about 75 feet from the edge of the lake. I unloaded my boat and motor and all the firewood from the back of the truck. By the time I had the gear arranged and boat in the water, it was getting close to noon. I grabbed a few sandwiches out of the cooler, jumped in the boat and turned north to fish with the slight breeze coming up the lake. The reason I'm going into such detail about everything comes into play here a little farther on. The way my truck was parked, the wind direction, etc., etc. I went north for about an hour. I'd used my little four horse kicker motor to cruise up the lake about three quarters of its length, spun back about, spun about to face back south and drop the line in the water. I now pulled the kicker motor up and dropped my little electric thruster in. With the slight breeze coming up the lake, the little electric had just the right slow, sweet spot speed for my lake troll to bob the broad tip perfectly. I had a perfect day. No boats, no noise, sunny, a few clouds, and a nice slight breeze bringing the tiniest ripples on the water. Perfect fishing day. I was about an hour in and about 10 or 15 minutes away from the campsite when I first noticed it. It was a god-awful stench that would hit me every few minutes. The kind of smell when you encounter a dead carcass that had been bloating for about a week. It was terrible, and I figured there must have been a deer or a bear carcass laying on, on the beach a few hundred yards upwind. I steered the boat another 40 feet offshore to get away from the smell. Snow is about 60 to 70 feet offshore, and the smell seemed to have abated. If you look at a satellite shot of Chilliwack Lake and view the south end, you will see there is almost a point where Depot Creek runs into the lake. It has a tree barrier, and it is not until you are past a clump of trees before the creek that you can see the beach area and the location where my truck was parked. I was still 60 to 70 feet offshore, trolling in. My plan was to troll right by the creek mouth, then beach the boat and grab some relaxed time and have a snooze. Well, let me tell you, that never happened. When I cleared the clump of trees, I was still gazing at the lake when sudden movement behind the driver's fender of my truck grabbed my attention. Even with the canopy blocking my view, I could see what looked like a large black bear with his back to me standing beside my truck. Our minds play funny tricks on us. They make you see things, or it's just not capable of comprehending things that we have never seen before. What I thought was a black bear soon ended up being something that would turn my mind and world inside out. This being, as you call him, sensed me and turned towards the lake. When it caught sight of me, instead of running towards cover like normal animals, it ran directly around my truck and straight towards the lake edge. So big and huge, it was mammoth in size. It ran on two legs. It was like time stopped as I watched this thing run towards me. I remember and replay every second it took to reach the water's edge constantly in my mind. I was fortunate that the boat was slowly veering off away from shore. I was now eyeball to eyeball with this creature, maybe 70 feet away from shore. Almost in a state of auto motion, I cut the power in the electric motor. It was something, it was like something came over me and I could not move. I could not do anything but stare at the enormity of this monster. It was jet black, except for the hair near its face, which had some mottled gray. It had almost no neck, broad, about three and a half feet wide. I then noticed its left arm was odd. It was dangling by its side and quite withered in comparison to the other arm. It had no mass to it, and I realized it was either a crippled or injured arm. Then the scream came. Never have I heard or seen something so awful. I could literally feel the power of the scream. It was deafening and made my head pound. I felt nauseous and stunned, and I felt my body let go and I urinated myself. Sitting like a, bic a victim, bobbing around on my boat, this wild animal would have torn me to shreds if I had been within its reach. No doubt in my mind I would have been a dead man if I had reached the beach. After three huge screams, it turned its upper body towards the creek and the entry road, 
It then looked back at me, kind of showed me its teeth. I will detail features after I finish my train of thought here. Then it turned towards my campsite and bolted for the tree line. I saw it grab its left arm by the wrist while it ran. The crippled arm was swinging loosely by the time he grabbed it. Never have I seen an animal so large move so fast. It was at the tree line and disappeared, disappeared in mere seconds. It felt like an eternity that I sat there trying to comprehend what just happened. And then I heard the noise. There's a bunch of trucks coming down the main gravel road. I could hear the gravel and the motors coming down the road. They were maybe half a mile away from the turn. The Sasquatch heard this way before I did, and that's why I ran off. I was never so thankful to have more people around me in my life. These trucks came up to the Depot Creek turn and turned in. They were full of all young guys and girls coming to party at the beach. I felt the tears running down my face as I switched the power back on my motor and went to shore. I was a mess, shaking, piss all over my pants, sweat pouring down my forehead. I jumped into the water up to my crotch so my piss stains would look like I was in the lake. I drug my boat up to my truck with all the gear still in it. Adrenaline will do that to you. When I got to my truck, I saw the reason this being was so mad. I had disturbed its food supply. My plywood grub box, which I had left sitting on the tailgate, was beside the driver's side, lid torn off, broken all to rat shit. You remember those nice aluminum Coleman's? It was bent to hell as well. The frozen meat was still there, the bag of fruit. I had was mostly just chunks laying on the ground. I had about a half a dozen apples and four or five oranges in a paper sack next to the cooler in my plywood kit box. Apples and oranges were all gone, just bits laying on the ground. I picked up all remnants, threw them into the broken cooler. I did not even bother putting the boat on the roof rack. I opened up the tailgate and literally stuffed the boat nose first into the box, tossed in all my gear in on top. I've never loaded my gear up in two minutes before, but I've never been so scared in all my life. The three trucks and all those kids had crossed the creek and were driving around behind me. They saw I was leaving and one truck pulled up beside me. He asked if I was leaving. I simply nodded and they asked if I was taking my firewood. The man should tell him to help himself. Looking back now, I should have told those kids to get the hell out of there, to go back down to the government site. If something had happened, it would have been 100% my fault. I recall trying to put the key in the ignition of my truck, hands shaking so violently that I had to use both to put a key in. I remember driving back towards government campsite at the north end of the lake and feeling like I was going to vomit. The anxiety was unbelievable. My entire body was still shaking. When I arrived in the parking lot at the north end, I changed my pants and clothes in my truck. My boat was almost falling out the back. I secured it with some rope, pulled a jug of water out, and left that parking lot full throttle. The next few days were terrible. I had a continuous nightmares. I could not eat. I couldn't sleep. I sequestered myself in my house. I didn't even unload my truck for two days. On the fourth day, I was starting to get a grip. I was alive. I avoided getting ripped apart, and I made it home in one piece. I would reflect on it, relive it, and try to tell myself the outcome was positive. But it felt like ch such a chicken shit. Weak coward or something along those lines. I've always, I always packed when I'm camping, and I had a 44 mag lever behind the seat that day. Would the outcome have been different if the gun was in the boat with me? With the state of mind I was in when this effort was screaming at me, allowed me to pick up my gun and burn a few holes in them. I've questioned myself for years regarding this. I think the outcome would have remained the same. I don't think this. I don't think I was in any state of mind to have picked up my rifle and fired. The term "infrasound" has been tossed around by the Sasquatch community. Is that what it is? Facts, visual, height. Measuring the height of my truck six foot four inches and the fact that I was viewing his right hand shoulder, back and head above my canopy, I would say eight foot six give or take. Weight? Not as filled out as a grizzly, but still very thick throughout the neck, shoulders, and back. The legs and hips were proportionate and did not look long or short. It had massive thighs. My guess would be six fifty to seven hundred pounds. Arm length was long, just above knees. Right arm was huge and was covered in two inch long coarse hair. Left arm was withered and dangled by its side the entire time. I saw no movement in this arm. My guess it had an accident or was involved in a fight with one of its own or eyes were black, no white seen, large and wide, deep set. There was no hooded lids from my recollection. Mouth lips were dark gray, same with mouth's interior. There were no distinguishable red gums. They were lighter gray. 
teeth were flat and rounded tops, except for the incisors, which were rounded and longer, almost an omnivore style of tooth. The mouth was large and flat. You could see the jaw muscles when it was screaming. The teeth were distinct light brown yellow. The nose was broad, flat, dark in color. The nostrils were not turned upward like in most artist renditions I've seen. Picture a boxer's nose, but a larger scale. I've watched most of your videos, and I love to read the comment sections. There's a few who write, They are not there to hurt you. They just want to be left alone. I wish that one day I could go see one. Steve, you know better, and I know better. These are not friendly giants. They're not stuffed animals. They're wild, smart animals. Who, if given the chance, would pull you apart like a rag doll or gnaw on your bones? People who want to see one would change their minds after my experience. I think they know what a gun is. And if they see a person with a gun, they avoid. I believe they travel in small packs, and maybe the one I stumbled upon was an outcast because of his injury, a hindrance to their community, so they ousted him from the group. I've tried to go back to the woods every year ever since. I can't bring myself to get it done. I've sold all my guns, camping, hunting gear. Once a year I venture out to a tourist trap lake in the interior, paved roads, log cabins. You know the ones. That's about as outdoorsy as that's about as outdoorsy as I get now. It's a shame. Well, that about sums it up. I wish this had never happened. If I could turn back time, I would be 150 feet off the beach with a 4570 and a hunting buddy with me. This bastard would have not to worry about scaring the shit out of anyone ever again. and would be on a slab in the anthropology department at UBC, and the mystery would be over. Keep up the great, keep up the great work and keep up your sixth sense. Call me Bob. All right, Bob. That's uh, one hell of a shit-eating experience, man. That's not a. That's not a cool experience. And it's also not the first time a, a wounded Sasquatch has been reported either, right? The Bosberg incident. The Bosberg cripple, I think it was called. It's funny because the crow flies right there on their side of the valley. There's tons of sightings. I never had anything happen on this side ever in years. It's weird. But anyway, um, I wonder, you never know that group of people that came after you. The chances of them having their shit ransacked late in the night were pretty high that weekend, wouldn't you think? And if any of those people were, did have, if they did have something like that happen to them as well after you left, the chances are one or more of them are probably watching this channel right now. And if you are, and this sounds familiar, Depot Creek, north end of Chilliwack Lake, um, in 1986, then you might have possibly had somebody take your food and scare the shit out of you. Then uh, you can email it into me at sharemystoryhowtohunt.com or tellmystoryhowtohunt.com and, and we'll share it with the rest of the planet and get your experience off your chest and get you back that respect you deserve, right? Who would ever want to go through that? Especially when it sees you and comes running towards you with absolute rage on the go. That's not a very smart move either though, is it? I mean, I just don't understand the desperation, the acts of desperation in a way as some of these things do, you know, like that one in particular. What's it thinking? Broad daylight, it's gonna go hit up your truck for your food. Didn't even know where you were. You could have crossers on it with a 300 Magnum anywhere at the time. You never know, right? And then, uh, you know, I, I always tell everybody, if you ever see one of these things, don't shoot it if you don't have to. I would not shoot it because I am a firm believer. You would probably be starting something that you wish you never did. But what do you do when something, it's fair game. I mean, if, if, if you turn the tables, if you put one of those suckers somewhere on a beach and you snuck up on it and then it saw you and you ran towards it 20 more meters and stared it down and growled and screamed at it, I'm pretty sure it's going to either fight you to the death instantly <laughs> or take off, right? I mean, you can't be that stupid. Why would you offer up and tempt a human being to put a hole in your frickin' head like that unless you weren't here very long and you're absolutely inexperienced and you had never been here before and possibly, possibly never even seen a human before? There's always that chance, right? I'll tell you what, the majority of these things that have seen humans with guns, they don't want nothing to do with them. I'll never forget that guy in BC that was talking to me and John Bendernagel and told us about having a, his 30-odd-six scope on the forehead of that one. I think he said it was like 20 yards or something. 
and he said he could see the wrinkles in his forehead and the whites of its eyes. And he put his crosshair from eyeball to eyeball down to its mouth and back up to its forehead. And then his buddy came out and that thing jumped behind the tree and was just poking, poking out, looking, poking at him, looking out the tree when that crosshair was coming up. And it knew what that gun, it knew what the gun was. But a lot of these things, the way they react and act, it's like they've never been here before. You never know, right? But anyway, but anyway, I think I'll leave that one alone by itself, and I'm going to keep hiking. And I'll, uh, let's get her up over top of this mountain and head start heading back down that big, big timber. I'll see if there's a cool spot there to stop. And, and I'll do another share there. And i got a big day ahead of me tomorrow. I'm going to go way up valley, and I think I just might go, uh, I think I just might go into the stand tomorrow. And there's a huge trail at the end of the corner of the swamp. I just might go in there, and I might bring a couple pounds of meat and hang it up way up in the tree and put a camera in there see exactly how long and how many grizzly bears I get on that trail camera. It might be kind of cool. And then maybe I'll give you guys a tour of the stand and we'll take a look at those lag bolts and uh, I'll show you what went down in there. Why not? And then after that, I'm going to go far up the valley. I'm going to bail into that big, wide open valley, river bottom, flat. And I'm going to go for about an hour, two hour power hike straight up the valley in the middle of the river. See what kind of game animals are running around that soft dirt and what kind of tracks are left in the sand. I love doing that because uh, there's a lot of elusive game animals running around here. You rarely see them, but they can hide their tracks. I love soft ground with tracks. And that valley bottom, that river flat, it's all, there is just nothing but soft stuff all over the place. It's pretty impossible to run across that valley without leaving your prints, right? And then I might bring a... Uh, I'll bring the flying camera, I'll fly that up and see if we might be able to spot a grizzly bear or those moose too. I think that'll be really, really cool. And that's tomorrow's project, early in the morning. But anyway, I'm gonna get my butt in gear. Day's creeping on, it's definitely not warm here. It looks like it, but it's not. It's chilly, and I got fairly wet with sweat, so sitting here cools, cools them right off. I'm gonna have to get moving. Oh, so don't forget. Share my story at hunt.com, tell my story at hunt.com, and mail it in, and we'll get to it. Be safe.